<clears throat> Delphine just sent a message to Lamia. Leslie, you're with us. Yes, I'm here. Uh, okay, <laughs> so I feel relieved. Uh, can I assume we won't be starting the webinar until Lamia connects and we can test her connection as well? French is not yet, and um, Dorothée should also. Oh, I hope they have a good connection. I will see that. I will send them in any case. Uh, so Dorothée as well should have the, um, a panelist connection. Yeah, I, I forwarded that to her. Yep. I've okay. just been in touch with her saying that uh, she needs to use it. And that, then she'll need to change her, um, her name when she, when she logs in. Thank you, Peter. Just for us to start to getting prepared, I ask uh, Maya, Peter, and Michael also to close their cameras. And uh, Claire, please stay. Uh, sorry, Peter, you as well, because Lemme is going to join. And, uh, and then the others we can close later. <laughs> Very happy to turn mine off. Hi, Dorothy. Hello, Dorothy. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Morning, Dora. You, you just need to change your name. Oh, you've done it. Well done. That's okay. Great. Dorothy, uh, Lamia is not yet connected. And so we try to. Right. Okay, let me call her. Thank you. Delphine has, has been messaging her, so just for your information. Also, I mean. Ah, she's here. Bonjour la mia. Bonjour la mia. We do not hear you. You're mute. Okay, great. So, hi, Andres. Hi, uh, Parag. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Uh, I'm doing perfectly fine. <laughs> thank you. Okay, great. We're in your head, uh, in your hand, sorry, uh, Claire. So um, I think we can begin. Whenever you want. You want an OECD uh, backdrop? No, not, not, you know, we are so many with an OECD uh, background, so please feel free. Okay, so just before we start, Parag, where are you? Which country now? Where are you talking from? Oh, uh, normally I'm based in Singapore. That's, that's where I call home, but uh, I'm actually in, in Paris today. So I'm probably nice. in the same city as many of you. You should have come here. But everything is remote, right? <laughs> everything is remote, but we can welcome sometimes some people when, you know, we could have organized uh, the, the talk from here. It's, I had, I had no idea, you know, months ago when we scheduled this, I had no, absolutely no idea that I would be in Paris today. It's a, it's a pure, pure coincidence. Well, wow. nice one. <laughs> <laughs> And Andres, I, I, I assume you are in, uh, in London. I am in London in my office, yes. At the LSE Parag, you probably rec recognize this. Ah, this yes, the, the, the bookshelves did look familiar. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which building are you in? I'm in St. Clements. Uh, okay. Yeah, one of the oldest buildings now <laughs> with a, the, an ever-changing campus. Uh -huh. Just one second, huh? Okay. When did you finish your PhD here? 2010. 2010. And have you been uh, since or? Hey, you are. I've come back quite a few times. Yeah. Most of my books since then, I've done events uh, to launch in uh, the Zayed Theater or the Old Theater and uh, drop by uh, from time to time. With, sometimes if I'm in London for completely other things, I will go for a run and I always run to the campus just to see what new buildings have popped up and what construction is underway. And uh, mm -hmm. I get very nostalgic. Well, just let me know if you're here, I'll be uh, very happy to invite you for lunch at the senior common room. 
Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I would love to. Mm -hmm. Dear colleagues, I think we need to begin, and uh, I please uh, uh, Leslie to let enter. Um, okay. If, if everyone is ready, I'm going to go ahead and hit the start webinar button. Thank you. Thank you. Lamia, I think you can start. Great. Um, so uh, distinguished uh, speakers and they're all, I am Lamia Kamashawi. I'm the director of the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship uh, SMEs Regions and Cities. We call it CFE. And I'm really pleased uh, to welcome you all to the, uh, the latest webinar in our uh, series of CFG Cogito Talk. This is the name of our series of uh, webinars. So today's discussion will focus on the uh, geographies of opportunities in the new global environment. We will have the pleasure of uh, hearing from a special guest, Dr. Parag Kana, who will give us a presentation of his new book, Move the Forces Approaching Us, before uh, taking part in a dialogue with uh, Dr. Uh, Rodrigu uh, Andres rodriguez Pozzi. So the theme of uh, today's uh, seminar touches on issues at uh, the very uh, heart of uh, this, the mission of uh, our center, the CFE, looking at the uh, geography of opportunities, but also the, uh, the geography of inequalities has long been at the core of our work to promote uh, competitive, dynamic, and uh, inclusive regions. And over the past two years in particular, we have seen how uh, COVID-19 has significantly underscored or even uh, exacerbated the very different ways in which uh, regions are uh, affected by global shocks and also by uh, mega trends like the digital and the green transitions. And as we uh, look ahead, at how we can best support regions in the recovery. We want to be inspired. We want to be inspired by new ideas, by new people, by new approaches. So uh, that's the reason why we have invited uh, Dr. Kana. Dr. Kana's new book, which draws a map of the world of tomorrow shaped by climate change and mass uh, migrations will certainly be uh, very inspiring. Uh, Dr. Kana is, among many things, an advisor to governments and organizations worldwide. He's a founder and managing partner of Future Map, a data and scenario-based uh, strategic advisory firm. He's also the best-selling author of uh, numerous books on the present and future of the world order, including The Future is uh, Asian, Commerce, Conflict, and Culture, in the 21st uh, century. And I had myself the pleasure of meeting Dr. Kana in New York in uh, 2019, where we were both uh, intervening in conference on the future of uh, real estate. And actually, um, Parag, you did offer me this book. And so I'm yeah. gonna have some publicity for you. It's, yeah. a, it's a great book. Uh, so uh, today we will hear uh, from you on uh, a, new, uh, a new important uh, publication that you have just uh, released. Uh, you, will paint, you painted in, in, this, uh, in this book a picture of a future world order shaped by mobility and 
what it will take to win the war for young talent, a very important uh, subject. Uh, Dr. Kana's research has profound implications for regions and cities as they chart a path toward more inclusive and sustainable development. So Dr. Kana's keynote speech will be followed by a dialogue with Dr. Andres rodriguez Pose. Dr. Pose is the uh, Princesa de Asturias Chair and a professor of economic geography at the London School of Economics. His research spans topics of regional growth and inequality, fiscal and political decentralization, discontent and populism and migration. And uh, Dr. Pose regularly collaborate with us in CFC as part of our program of work of the uh, Regional Development Policy uh, Committee. So we are really delighted to have him today to moderate the second, the second portion of this discussion where he will actually extract from the keynote address core insight for regional policy makers and uh, researchers. And after uh, around 20 minutes of dialogue between the speakers, we will open the floor to a Q&A with the audience and we will close this webinar with some words from Claire Charby, whom I would like to thank uh, very much for organizing this very uh, uh, interesting conversation. And now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to hand over the floor to uh, Dr. Parag Kana. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lamia, thank you, Claire. I'm uh, honored to be joining this conversation and discussion series today and looking forward uh, to the dialogue with uh, Andres and with all of the participants. Um, it really is an honor, I have to say, it was 20 years ago, uh, almost to the day, that I first set foot in the OECD in Paris for a, a conference that was um, providing a platform for young people, for youth. At the time, I actually was young, uh, to share their views on uh, sort of youth perspectives on global policy. And I was enamored with the talent that was present then. And so it's uh, something of an anniversary. I'll also say that uh, for everyone who is a reader of The Economist, as you well know, uh, the, the OECD is so often referred to as a rich country club or first world think tank. And these various kinds of missives that The Economist uses to describe uh, the OECD. And I want to say that in my view, uh, going back more than 20 years as a researcher, the OECD to me is the world's most relevant policy research organization that actually is uh, such a guidepost in many ways and should be followed you know, even more closely than it already is uh, by decision makers and by researchers around the world. So I'm a great admirer of what the OECD does. And I'm again, just uh, honored to be joining you today. So um, I know that we're all very, very keenly focused on this topic about the future of our economic geography in light of a wide range of disruptive forces, whether it is COVID or whether it is uh, globalization and economic competition, and of course, demographics. And I want to just briefly tie some of these together from the perspective of the research that I've been doing. And I'll also say again, given that uh, this is the OECD's audience and the, the quality of your research is so impeccable, any deviation in my presentation uh, from your own forecast is strictly my own fault. And uh, I will bear responsibility for whatever margin for error appears there. Uh, but let me jump right in because you know the, the task in futurism, as many people would describe this endeavor, uh, is to look at scenarios. So it isn't just linear extrapolation, it's about positing what might be, what might happen, but based upon some kernels of uh, present reality. So let me go ahead and, uh, and share my screen and jump right in. I'll share a few slides uh, to kick off the discussion. So I've titled this Winning the War for Young Talent, and the emphasis is here on, on youth. One might even say that this is a very ageist book that I've written. I've taken the youth of the world as my protagonist and tried to forecast what world they are inheriting over the next 10, 20, 30 years, and how they, as a generational cohort, 
distributed around the world may respond to it. One of the points of departure of the book is the global demographic landscape. We've all grown up in a world in which the total world population nearly quadrupled over the course of the 20th century, but fertility actually began to decelerate uh, towards the, in the into the 1970s and onward, such that we are now reaching uh, the moment that I describe in the book as peak humanity. I think that everyone on this call today will probably live to see the moment roughly 10 to 15 years from now, approximately, when our newspapers on the front page, you know, everywhere in the world say, the world population has reached its peak, it will now begin to decline. And that is not a moment that any of us thought was going to come anytime soon, nor as soon as it is about to come. And every period, every, re, every increment of time, every research interval in global demographic forecasting that has been, that has transpired over the last 20 years has brought that date closer and closer and closer. In other words, we have been very far off the mark if you go back 20 years in terms of our global demographic projections. It was just 20 years ago that many people still believe that we were heading into a Malthusian crisis of global overpopulation, a world, uh, a total stock of humans that could reach 14 billion people. Before the pandemic, actually, the Gates Foundation and the University of Washington had brought that down to about 11 billion or 11.5 billion. And that was not fully taking into account a number of factors that have traditionally um, misled, if you will, uh, demographers into the wrong direction of still overestimating fertility. Uh, for example, urbanization, female empowerment, cost of living, the psychological factors around climate change and so forth. And certainly when they produced those most recent forecasts, it was before the pandemic, before the baby bust of the pandemic. And now it looks like we'll probably reach this moment again of demographic plateau even sooner. And at a lower number, I'm giving multiple scenarios here, somewhere between 9.5 or perhaps at the highest end 10 billion people is again, roughly where I'm situating uh, my argument. Again, it doesn't matter exactly what the number becomes. It's the fact that it is going to be far, far, far less this peak humanity number will be a much smaller number. We are already effectively at the maximum number of people that will ever simultaneously be alive because the, 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 the sort of delta between where we are and where we might be is really quite small at this point. Not to mention the fact that if you geographically distribute this, many countries, certainly OECD member states are already at peak humanity with very low fertility, and a need for significant inward migration. So the range of the consequences of this uh, that relate to dependency ratios and fiscal policy to immigration policy are certainly very, very acute. And that's where I uh, sort of begin the investigation. I mentioned briefly the baby bust. Uh, it wasn't just the pandemic, uh, of course, it's really going back to the financial crisis and pre-financial crisis in which economic stress was one of the leading factors in the decline of fertility in developing in developed countries. And in surveys that have been done amongst among youth today that are of childbearing age, young people who are considering starting families, why it is that they only have one child or no children, uh, the reasons that are given tend to gravitate into the environmental. And then if you see this you know, bar on the right, you know, if you have one less child, you will significantly reduce your uh, family's uh, per capita CO2 equivalent uh, footprint. And this has a deep impact, apparently, on young people. If you are over the age of 40 on this call, I must, you know, issue a certain asterisk right now, which is that we don't see the world the way many young people do. And we really do have to stop and pause and put ourselves in the shoes of the world population that is under the age of 30 or 20. And I will say that that has been a significant component of my research. It is going country to country and talking to very young people to try to understand the world through their eyes. And I commend that practice to everyone to really see the world through the eyes of the future. Because if you are, if we are old, we are not the future. We will not be around in the future. And so I say this very bluntly, 
that this is how young people are seeing the world. We can, you can dismiss it if you like to, but that would be an error. Uh, so, you know, generational psychology is a very important factor here. Now, if you take the issues, the environmental, the, the, uh, the uh, sort of in, um, um, economic stress of the financial crisis, uh, going back a dozen years ago, and then the rise of climate change as a motivating factor in reducing uh, family size, and now the pandemic baby bust, you end up in a situation where actually Generation Alpha, who are the children of today's um, uh, um, uh, millennials or um, or a younger Gen X or or, uh, or sort of middle middle tier millennials, that generation is yet to be fully born. That generation will complete its birth cycle in around 2025. But at that point, in other words, if we were to were to reconvene in January 2026, we might well see that because of this. COVID correction, this second baby bust in just a decade, right? The financial crisis baby bust and the COVID baby bust, which combined are very, very severe and have a very tangible impact on the total human population. It could be that Generation Alpha will have been smaller than Generation Z. Generation Z will prove to have been the largest cohort ever produced by our species. Uh, and that it is going to continue to decline uh, from there. So we're at a really seminal moment in global demographic uh, history. But that doesn't mean that we are rapidly depopulating, though that is certain to happen as baby boomer mortality accelerates, the world population will decline. The question is simply how quickly. But we are still left with the present stock of the world population, who again are mostly young. We talk about an aging world because again, from our OECD perspective, our countries are aging. But globally speaking, uh, more than half the world population is still under the age of 40. So Generation Y, Generation Z, and Generation Alpha are, uh, to me, the people exactly the human beings who literally constitute the future. And because they are not having children, or as many children, the, a weird thing happens, which I can only describe in science fiction terms. I say the present is the future. Because if the present is not giving birth to a larger generation of itself, it is not only the present, but it remains the dominant generation of the future. That's literally what appears to be happening today before our very eyes. The present is the future. So that's uh, the macro demographic uh, outline. Now, I made a point earlier about seeking to empathize with the youth of the world. And I also articulate it in this more colloquial way as well. We very often use this pronoun, we, say, you know, we believe or the people think, you know, and we, we, we reify our points of view. It is as if the uh, archetypical human being in the world is a two income, you know, a husband, wife, married couple, two income household with two children living in a suburban, uh, you know, Western uh, sort of, you know, environment. But that isn't what the sort of median human being, if there is such a thing, as a median human being in the world, what, who is that person? And the way I see it, this demographic that I'm talking about is, comes closer to almost a flip of that traditional archetype. To me, you have a large mass of people in the world who are young, who are single, in other words, unmarried, who are childless, who are financially struggling, and who live, uh, who are renters, or do not own property. They live in small apartments or tenements in the developing world uh, in very large cities. So that is, if there is a person for us to focus this conversation on, or at least the, the subject matter that I have chosen to put front and center, it is today's young people who are single, childless, financially struggling, and renting in not only developing countries, but really globally. And that is several billion people several billion people. And this is the story of who they are, where they are, how they think, and how they would like to be more mobile. How they think, first of all, generationally. And we have many surveys that show that they subscribe to certain horizontal values, uh, as I mentioned at the bottom, connectivity, sustainability, mobility, and are less defined by nationality, ethnicity, and other kinds of traditional uh, values. And, uh, and because they do not own property and do not have children, they are actually more mobile. And a lot of the work that has now been sort of catching up, a lot of the research during the pandemic around digital nomads and youth nomads points out that in terms of whether it's uh, digital workers, 
or in general, young migrants, it is people who are age 20 to 30 that represent the largest uh, current pool and potential pool of uh, outward migrants in the world. And it makes total sense. Again, the difference being that whereas in previous generations, at least in Western societies, eventually, for example, after the 1960s, and there was, of course, strong countercultural movements, but what happened? Well, of course, um, men and women did eventually settle down, get married, uh, have children, become homeowners, and uh, come of age in a time of global economic expansion. Uh, that's not the scenario for today's young people. It is not to be presumed that they will simply uh, chill out, uh, settle down, uh, get married, uh, have children, you know, own homes, and, and be stable. There's no reason whatsoever to presume that that pattern will repeat itself when the material conditions, the environmental conditions, the economic realities, and so forth are so different today. So again, I create scenarios around where this, where this might take us. Um, now let's talk about the movement of people. Um, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, OECD research and, and many other sources demonstrate, uh, you know, it is what I think of call a sort of free agent world, a world in which young people could potentially go anywhere if they're talented and you know, where they might be welcome. Um, and what's interesting to see is the declining share of the total annual migrant pool, if you will, that is absorbed by the United States for a range of reasons, whether it is the rise of emerging markets or whether it is populism and you know, uh, too much unpredictability in immigration policy, um, you know, many other factors really that have driven this uh, trend. Uh, one more slide about the United States, because the most recent census did come out in the U.S. Uh, last uh, autumn, and it demonstrates that th they've had the slowest rate of population increase uh, going back to something like the late 18th century. Um, and you have the aging society, therefore, and a high dependency ratio. So in other words, America is starting to take on European-like uh, demographic uh, characteristics, which is, of course, very worrying from a fiscal standpoint. And in terms of maintaining that, uh, that, that dynamism that has tended to drive the US economy and innovation uh, moving forward. Uh, the numbers are still, though, more extreme you know, in Europe because, of course, of the higher proportion of the population that is uh, elderly uh, over the age of uh, 65 and the robust welfare state and the costs associated um, with entitlement uh, spending. Therefore, the dependency ratio is even higher. Uh, the fertility rates are still lower than American fertility rates um, because, of course, not only the, the sort of native indigenous population, but also the number of migrants who come in with higher birth rates is still far lower uh, as a share of the population and as a sort of um, and in terms of fertility than migrants into the United States. So this is a dilemma that, of course, every European is already familiar with in terms of the outstanding pension obligations um, that uh, that European societies face, and of course, still less friendly immigration policy than um, than the United States. Now, let me come back to these generational points about young people and the importance of countries rethinking their approach to this global demographic reality because they don't necessarily have one. This is not a set of background conditions that policymakers are spending a lot of time digging deep into and understanding that, um, as, I, as I argue, collecting people is collecting power. That despite cultural inhibitions and despite challenges of assimilation, all of our societies are at a stage where we really do need to actively compete in a war for young talent. That bringing in young people means that you are importing the taxpayers and the homeowners and the renters and the construction workers and the services economy workers um, and, the, and the students and so forth of the future. And without that, uh, you know, you don't actually have a future. Now, again, these are, you know, sort of fundamental realities and rhetorical statements that that some Western leaders have in, you know, perhaps internalized intellectually, but we're not really seeing a proactive change in policy stemming from these very hard hitting facts. And that's something that I would obviously like to bring about. And this is where I might shift a little bit from being just analytical towards being somewhat normative, because I want to see our societies remain open and attract talent and uh, be the sort of, um, you know, winners, if you will, that they have historically been. So let me say a few words about that. 
Um, one of the things I did, again, you know, in my research is to really challenge the notion uh, of national identity as a sacrosanct, immutable, you know, principle from the perspective of young people. As I mentioned, there's a lot of surveys that already bear this out in terms of how little uh, national identity and trust in existing political systems, uh, you know, appeal to young people around the world. In fact, according to a number of surveys, young people view populism in their own societies as a greater threat to their political stability than immigration itself. One of the things I also did was to look at the longevity of anti-immigrant populist governments and how in a way, of course, political populism in general and anti-immigrant positions in particular aren't, don't really constitute a viable economic strategy. I also looked at conscription to challenge the notion of a sort of, you know, again, an immutable nationalist essence. And the funny thing is, the irony really, is that I looked at every country in the world that actually has military conscription for 18 year old men. And what you may already know, but to me it was something of a punchline, is that quite frankly, the rite of passage for every 18 year old male in every one of these countries is to get out of that country as quickly as possible. And so what, what nationalism is that? If young people, you know, if their first priority is to get out of that one sort of symbol, if you will, that one word that you might most associate with nationalism. So I found that to be really a, a huge irony that is a deep blow to the notion that is so pervasive in political science dialogues and conversations today around the return of the civilizational state and uh, you know nationalism as a bedrock principle and so forth. So I call that into question in many different ways. I also borrow from uh, the I think the very uh, impeccable uh, and 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 very um, you know sort of high high quality research of Philippe Legrand of uh, Britain who writes about the ways in which the pragmatic ways in which one can depoliticize immigration, uh, both in terms of the language we use around it in our in our politics, as well as the ways in which there can be a give and take around commitments that are made by uh, governments and by migrants in order to bring about um, a greater sense uh, of tolerance and acceptance and integration. And I think there's a lot that can be done in that regard that policymakers that, that politicians haven't been sufficiently brave enough to articulate. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those, I'm sure, in more uh, detail. Um, one of the things I also like to point out is, again, a macro historical point, which is that we're very, actually very good at mass migration. I've been speaking about this book for the last you know, three or four months. And very often people say, oh my goodness, mass migration, you know, this is a truly uh, you know, novel situation. How will we ever cope? And I'll say, how about we cope the way we have for the last you know, 250 years? Because I dare say when it comes to global policy thematics, perhaps mass migration is the thing that we've been best at, better than anything else. We've been terrible at maintaining global peace and stability, terrible at maintaining uh, equity in our economies and terrible at uh, managing the global commons. But we've been phenomenal at mass migrations. And I won't go into every single statistic, but one of the things I trace in the book is century by century, the number of migrants, the regions of origin, regions of destination, how the decimal place has been shifting to the right from millions to tens of millions to hundreds of millions of migrants uh, with each successive century. And how, of course, the winning societies of the past have been uh, uh, OECD countries, particularly United States and Canada that have been absorbing uh, uh, migration, migrants in very, very large numbers. And so I think this is an important just point, you know, where we take a step back and say, this is not new at all. And, and this is partially, very, very partially an anthropological book where I say, let's remember that we are a migrant species. We are a nomadic species for the better part of our 100,000 year history as a migratory species. Um, you know, we actually have this in our DNA, in our nature. And that, uh, again, over time, societies that have been open, whether they are empires or nation states, uh, have been most uh, successful. I use the example of Germany and the example of um, the famous uh, politician. Um, it was um, uh, uh, Jürgen Rutger, I think is his name, who, uh, yes, who said, uh, you know, Kinderstadt in there is this famous line, you know, saying that uh, we should have more children rather than having more Indians. Um, in our societies, immigrants. I, I went to high school in Germany, so for me, it's really funny. He said this at around the time that I was the only ethnic Indian uh, kid in a, a very significant radius 
around where I lived in Germany. And I have this, this sort of dream, you know, uh, where I put my arm around, uh, around Jürgen and I say, hey, Jürgen, you know, it's 1990 or, you know, whatever. And uh, can you imagine that in 30 years time, this will be the demographics of your country? Uh, you know, you will have about 6 million Eastern European and former Soviet uh, uh, you know, citizens. You'll have um, about 3 million Turks. You will have uh, a large number of Arabs, Southern Europeans. Uh, you'll have South Asians, hundreds of thousands of Indians and Pakistanis and Chinese and so forth. And of course, Jürgen would have a heart attack, right? He wouldn't possibly believe that this is what the demographics of his, his country would be. 30 years after or 20 years after making this statement. But of course, welcome to Germany of the year 2022. Here we are. This is actually the demographic composition of Germany. And so the fact is that, you know, if Germany and, and other countries in this uh, in, in Western Europe can make this shift, it it's obviously demonstrates that it is possible. Germany has become a melting pot. It is not done so, again, proactively and willingly, right? It is done so reactively and with a great deal of, of course, political consternation. But it has done so. And we, what we have seen in the most recent election is that despite this, and despite the, um, the, the again, the, the sort of internal debates, um, it has not led to the far right populist parties taking over. I think that's, of course, a positive sign. Now, the last couple of points, let me just talk about, again, uh, COVID, digital work, and talent mobility. Um, and the truth is that I, I don't want to be characterized as looking only at the kind of tip of the sphere of the data scientists and so forth. In, in, in my book, I deal with uh, construction workers, with nurses and maids uh, and other kinds of migrant laborers to a very large extent. I want to talk about the billions, not just the millions or the thousands. And uh, because that's actually my own family's origin and certainly my uh, ethnographic uh, origin, if you will. I spent my childhood in, in the Persian Gulf um, at the time after the, the republics had discovered oil and were importing large numbers of South Asians. And that's where I, why I spent my childhood there. Um, and so low and medium skilled workers, uh, whether they are uh, South Asian construction workers in the Gulf or Filipino maids or whatever the case may be, do represent the lion's share of the total migrant stock of uh, people in the world today, people just looking for economic opportunity, whereas technical specialists, people we would call expats, highly skilled migrants, are really a new vanguard, if you will. Uh, but that said, you know, more and more young people, of course, aspire to that transnational mobility based on whatever skill they can acquire that is relevant in uh, some market or the other. And what I'm seeking to bring about is, of course, a situation in which that supply and demand better connect uh, in an apolitical way, in a win-win way. Now, what's interesting is that within the OECD uh, countries and, and, and mostly OECD countries, the top tier of desirable destinations for talented migrants, the same places that need uh, caregivers and nurses and construction workers also need data scientists and software engineers and so forth. And you can see that it's becoming quite competitive um, in that top tier to attract young people and policies are starting to change around allowing permanent residency. Um, one of the fascinating things during COVID was that as much as we characterize it as a, as a moment when the world stood still, in truth, actually, um, about 70 plus countries announced nomad visa programs, realizing how important it is to be to have uh, services workers, to have investors, tourists, business travelers in your economy. Now, the fact that we went from two countries having nomad visa programs to 70 countries having nomad visa programs in the middle of a pandemic, I think is a very, very important signal for the future. And it speaks to this war for young talent we missed them when they were gone, right? When, we, when countries realize that suddenly, you know, you depend on that circulation of people and their consumption in your economies um, and as participants and agents in your economy, you suddenly start to compete, um, you know, to attract them as much as possible. And that's part of what's going on right now. And there's a set of policies around economic diversification, government grants, uh, ensuring affordable lit, uh, housing, um, industry, academia, linkages, uh, vocational training, and so forth that countries can undertake uh, to make themselves more young migrant talent friendly. 
and and I go into some detail on those in the in the book, and I'm sure that we will in this discussion as well. I give again just some of the latest survey data here around where software developers in particular are seeking to go to um, internet speed you know, versus uh, cost of living in some of the cities in the world. Now, again, two years ago, I don't think that we would be having a conversation about how Lisbon and Porto and Athens and Dubai and Bangkok and Bali are the hot places for young people to be getting on a plane, buying one-way tickets and going to. But young people, again, the protagonists of my story, have a survival instinct that those of us who are sedentary, those of us who are already stable and established in our geographic location, um, you know, uh, don't that they have that sixth sense that we don't have, and their sixth sense says that my income is unstable. I need a place that's affordable. I want to work remotely and have some kind of a work-life balance and this kind of thing. And so we're seeing a very large shift of people and a competition among these very places and many many others to attract them. Final couple of points panning back to the global demographics, Asia matters in this story because in a world of low fertility, where Asia is not only the, represents the largest share of the human population, it also still has a relatively high fertility and represents the largest share of um, working age millennials, the largest number of Gen Z and the largest number of Gen Alpha. You might well say that the largest demographic group on earth is young Asians. And again, the further you look in the future, the more significant today's Asian youth become because they become an ever more significant share of the world population. So we will find that countries are competing to attract uh, Asian youth, Asian talent. This you can already see in OECD data around the number of uh, young Indian professionals, young Chinese professionals, and other young Asians that are present in OECD economies. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I focus on in the book is what I call the Asian Europeans, because Europe, uh, you know, sort of has only about a stock of 4 million Asians right now versus 25 to 30 million in America. I build a scenario in the book around that kind of actually flipping in the future as more and more Asians may be attracted to Europe and may eventually even be welcome in Europe, given the economic uh, need for them. Final couple of points about climate change, because climate change matters very systemically um, in any picture, in any scenario about the future. This is the present human population distribution around the world. And this is what happens as climate change accelerates. You can see this is based on NASA, uh, NOAA, I, IPCC forecasts around the, what's called a suitability change. So countries in, or territories, geographies in red are becoming less suitable for human habitation and places in green become more suitable. And of course, here you have, again, the perverse irony that the depopulating geographies are the ones in green, whereas the heavily populous countries of today, again, particularly full of young people, are the ones that are turning red. And of course, I think it is a moral imperative for us to somehow compensate or correct for this significant misalignment between the, uh, survive the suitability of geographies as climate change accelerates and the current location of our human population. And of course, there is no roadmap to correct this imbalance. There is no uh, white paper from uh, the IPCC, from, from the COP26 process. The COP26 process consciously does not deal with mass climate migration and relocation of, of peoples because it's such a sensitive area of sovereignty. That doesn't mean that it is not uh, a very significant moral uh, and policy dilemma for us to grapple with at a, at a big picture. In the book, I build four scenarios. I will not speak through them now. I've already exceeded my, my time, but uh, and please do share these slides with anyone who's interested. But I construct the narrative around four possible scenarios for the relocation of the human population in the uh, decades ahead. It is not a utopian, naive uh, picture by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, three of the four scenarios are quite negative. They are either a persi persistent or extension of the status quo, which I call regional fortresses, or downright violent scenarios uh, around what I call neo-medievalism or barbarians at the gate. There's one scenario I posit called Northern Lights, uh, which is when I talk about what it would look like to um, you know, bring about this reconciliation of suitable geographies and, and the world's uh, mobile population. Um, you know, I think this is the point where we should, I should wrap up and we'll transition towards a policy conversation. But I do believe that, you know, we can start to have a more 
accessible conversation between leaders and citizens, businesses as well, around how dire you know our demographic situation is, and how necessary it is to to think about um, you know uh, the future of migration, uh, and why it is an opportunity, not just a challenge. How it is actually fundamentally geopolitical. My background academically is in geopolitical theory, and in nineteenth-century geopolitical theories, demographics mattered very significantly. It was literally a matter of you know um, ascribing greater weight and power formula to countries with larger populations. I mean, to start thinking in demographic terms about the relationship between um, population size, consumption, wealth, and so forth, and power as well in a world that is going to be in demographic decline. There are very noble policy instruments that have been devised, whether it is this uh, global compact for safe, orderly, regular, regular migration, or global skills partnerships that are sectoral and bilateral that have been advocated by uh, Michael Clemens from the Center for Global Development and others. And I think that we need to, again, depoliticize uh, the phenomenon of migration and think about it from the standpoint of you know, win-win kinds of uh, partnerships such as this as much as possible. My final point is, again, big picture, right? I mean, as someone who's trained in, 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 in geography in general and, and you know, seeks to uh, overcome deterministic thinking, uh, you know, I'd like us to think in terms of how you know, what, what we can achieve in this, with this coming generation and in the coming uh, decades is to focus on how we move people to the geographies of resources, how we move technologies to where they are needed by people, how we think about making mobility or codifying it as a human right and decoupling it from nationality, as we know that is such a limiting factor in mobility is people's nationality, the sort of prison of birth, if you will. And globally, of course, bringing again, the environment back in, thinking beyond sovereignty towards stewardship of, uh, of geographies and bringing our geographies more into alignment in terms of geography of resources, of boundaries, of economic activity, and of populations. And if we can do that, we'll bring about what I call civilization 3.0, a population that is more mobile and therefore responsive to disruptions, climatic or otherwise. Um, and hopefully we do that in a more technologically sustainable fashion as well, for which we do have all of the resources available today. So with that, let me stop and thank you again so much and over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Parag, for what has been a fascinating presentation. And before I start and I start our debate, I would like to remind everyone uh, participating in this talk that uh, if you want to ask questions uh, to Dr. Parakana, you can do it uh, directly in the question and answer session and there will be time for those questions to be uh, broadcast. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. I thought it's, uh, it was uh, really a very much uh, positive and optimistic scenario, one that I would uh, really like uh, to have in the future. But, um, you know, I'm um, perhaps a bit more pessimistic that you are in many ways, and you tend to deal possibly in terms of geographical dimensions, mostly with uh, the impact on the on the winners. I tend to focus, it's not that you don't deal with the losers, but I tend to focus in my work most on, on the losers. So I would like to ask you a series of questions on issues of mobility, transitions, territorial inequalities, and policies. But let me start with the issue of mobility and your numbers on mobility, which are starking in many ways. And you highlight that the percentage of what are called the location agnostic workers is uh, rising very rapidly. You are estimating that it would reach 40% and even beyond of the global workforce uh, uh, very, very soon. Yet the OECD, uh, after the pandemic and the department we are in, started doing calculations and it came out with the conclusion that only 26 out of OECD, 300 OECD regions included in that type of analysis were already at the level of 40% in 2020. We can imagine, although we don't have uh, the data, that for emerging and developing countries that percentage would be significantly lower. So there's a significant gap between what you are thinking, where you think we're going, and the situation right now. How can this gap be bridged, and how long do you think it will take? Mm -hmm. Great question. Well, first is a technical one. So 26 out of 300 OECD regions, but what percentage of the OECD working age population do those regions account for? Because, of course, the 40% estimate that's given is about the number of people irrespective of how they're geographically distributed. 
Mm -hmm. Well, these are mainly the largest uh, cities. Uh, it's mainly concentrated mm -hmm. in capital areas, although it's surprising that uh, some big American cities uh, don't come up, but some Europeans like London, like Paris, uh, Copenhagen, and some of the Nordics actually come up at that level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, location independent work, of course, is an is a, an, an either analysis or an estimate of work that can be done, you know, digitally, and you know, is not geography bound. It doesn't, of course, mean that those people will pick up and relocate either outside of their current location, even to move to a suburb of where they are, or elsewhere in the country, or to cross the border. So one doesn't necessarily give an indication of the other. Uh, in many ways, that data may have a greater impact on urban planning than on immigration policy, because of course, as the ratio of people in a given you know location could be location independent, that simply means that they might just be staying at home more and consuming less public transportation. So, you know, we can leave open the many directions in which as, and I think it's very good that you have the, the estimates broken down according to, let's call them, you know, smaller scale geography, cities and regions, because that is the correct way, of course, to think about uh, economic development and, and public policy to some degree, because we have such vast divergence within national boundaries around economic composition, a skills distribution and the kinds of work that are done in places. So, so I think that's extremely important work, and it just shows that we should, rather than you know, even with bumper stickers like from the um, Inter Internet Research Corporation or the International Data Corporation saying forty percent, it, it's a big number, but it's of course a global estimate, and it doesn't really shed light on on the particulars of, of place. Most workers under any scenario are still going to be tied to a certain geography. So non-tradable services will still be the dominant feature of our services economies, right? So people still have to be, most people still have to be somewhere to render some service, right? You know, in, in whether it's in the goods or services economy, whether it's in manufacturing or agriculture or even uh, consumption oriented services. So I'm not in any way a believer that everyone will be an untethered software programmer, you know, working on GitHub, you know, that that is just one set of, of people for sure. Now, even where, for example, government workers can do their work from home as governments are, of course, struggling to cope with, chances are a significant bureaucratic and regulatory apparatus would, you know, prevent them from simply being, um, you know, a civil servant of the French government, but living in the Seychelles, you know, uh, year round, you know, who knows? <laughs> Um, so I, I, like you, do take the macro estimates with a grain of salt because there are many layers and filters before that translates into, uh, you know, kind of a, a whole new reality. So it's, it's very interesting to juxtapose that forecast versus your very concrete data and say, well, what will happen in each of these places and what is different about these places? And I would rather do that than to generalize. You know, so if we were to speak about, well, what is happening in Eastern European places versus because they may actually start to attract back people on the basis of being lower cost, lower cost of living. So, you know, people who have moved away may go back. Tax policies may change at a national or a subnational level to attract young people. And these kinds of things will have, you know, a, an impact on that scale. So I, I don't think we can give an answer to when this will happen, quote unquote. We can simply say that it is happening in an accelerated fashion to a certain demographic and certain professions to which it applies, whereas others still remain very much fixed and, and non-tradable. Oh, uh, and uh, you raised the whole idea of uh, migration policy there and uh, your more optimistic scenario, which is the Northern Lights is one that probably we all would sign and would strive for. And in order to do that, you need massive migration. But uh, uh, although people are moving and you're saying they're moving, we're moving more than ever, uh, what we have now is that uh, although the population that was born as, as that is living outside their country of origin has tripled according to the World Economic Forum since 1970, it still represents uh, just 3.5 of the world population. And you are talking about that we should follow the example of Canada, which uh, targets 400,000 new permanent residents every single year. But let's suppose an, a scenario of massive movement, uh, one that would lead to this uh, Northern Lights. If let's say 1% of 
the current world's population of uh, 8 billion were to move, that is 80 million every year, we probably will need across the world 100 candidates uh, to accomplish those uh, targets, which would be a minimum target. Do you think this is realistic in the current political scenario? And if so, and probably more importantly, can it be achieved without significant political upheaval? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So two data points first. One is that at the outset of the book, I say that in all likelihood, the, the pool of individuals that are actually mobile across borders um, is probably less than 4 billion people, you know, of a total world population of 8 billion people. And I go into why. You know, old, infirm, poor, you know, immobile peoples of uh, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, and so forth, you can pretty much bracket out for better or worse. Um, you know, half the world's population. Also, geography matters tremendously. The people of Eurasia, who represent two thirds of the human population, are far more internally mobile than the capacity of South Americans to move to North America or Africans to move to another continent. And geography matters, of course, very, very significantly. So there's a stickiness there. So that's one point to, to, to put aside for just a moment. So we're not really talking about you know, 8 billion people. We're talking about several billion people. And then I also, of course, further circumscribe it by age because young people are inherently more mobile for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Uh, secondly, it's not achieving Northern Lights instantaneously as an end state, but rather obviously a gradual recirculation of that target set of demographics to new, uh, new, new, new locations. And not of course, in a geographically blind way in the sense that yes, Canada is attracting Latin Americans, Asians, uh, you know, all manner of, of people from around the world, but by and large, uh, as has been the case historically, there are particular geographical vectors that will simply deepen and become more pronounced over time. So I mentioned one earlier when I was speaking about uh, Asian populations moving west towards Europe. Now, again, there's a noticeable increase in the number of South and East Asians in Western Europe, leaving aside uh, Britain, which obviously has a significant post-colonial uh, influx from South Asia. And that even as those numbers have grown, as I mentioned, it's still relatively small and there's enormous scope for growth there, given the complementarities between Europe and Asia, the trade linkages, the infrastructure connections, the, uh, of course, the, the demographic mismatch and, and labor market shortages and so forth. So I think it's fairly safe to presume that that number is going to continue to expand and that that dyad, if you will, between Europe and Asia will expand over time. Um, in, I don't want to say an American direction, because of course it was a true explosion at various um, uh, moments in time in the 19th century and the late 20th century. You probably won't have anything like that given European politics, but gradual expansion of the number of Asians who arrive and assimilate. And of course, again, we can all witness this here in Europe over the past 25, 30 years. Anyone who's been living in Europe uh, off and on would notice that anyone who is European will attest to it. Um, the, another one of the dyads that I talk about is South Asians to Central and, uh, and Northern Asia, which is to say Russia and the former Soviet Union. That's another geographical dyad that I have been tracking myself for decades in my travels in the region, and even very recently, and I, and I gave you know, examples in the book, and I talk in some of my reportage about the growing number of South Asian uh, populations that you, that you meet in Central Asia, in Russia, and elsewhere, and how Russian policy itself is starting to change. Uh, Russian public opinion, Russian immigration policy, Russian skills-based kinds of migrant uh, uh, you know, policies are adapting uh, to this new reality because, of course, they are now the world's largest wheat exporter. They're bringing in investment from China for infrastructure projects. They're seeking to diversify their economy. And, of course, they're rapidly depopulating all as this is happening. So I have direct quotes and evidence and experience from talking to people in Russian regions about how they really do want to step up their migration. Now, is Russia going to be the Eurasian Canada? Of course not, right? Not anytime soon, you know, not by any stretch of the imagination. So, but, you know, it's not about there being 100 Canadas, if you will. It's really because we will not achieve that perfect world. We will not achieve that Northern Lights scenario. We will not achieve that utopian recirculation of, you know, two or three billion vulnerable people. But we can try to add up 
through these various movements, how many people is Japan taking? How many people is Germany taking? How many more foreigners will be in Scandinavia? How many more migrants will be in Russia? How many will be in Canada? How much will American policy change? And so on and so on and so on. It does add up. And I, I go around the world to many other geographies as well that we haven't yet talked about, uh, including the Caucasus and Anatolia and other places where that are climate habitable, but that are depopulating in the present and what the, the new demographics of those geographies might look like. And I can't give one answer to what the political accommodation process will be, right? Because we didn't know, we, we, we didn't know um, that, I gave the example of Germany, that German, Germany's demographics would be what it in fact is today, even 10 or 15 years ago. We did not know that. And if I told you 10 years ago that Japan, if I told you five years ago, that Japan would in the year 2021 and 2022 legislate permanent residency for even low and medium skilled workers, you would say, you would laugh at me, right? You would laugh me out of the room. But of course, that's exactly what Japan has actually just done. And now you have Nepali and Indian construction workers who are permanent residents of Japan. So there is change happening. And it's not just at the margins. It is in very significant countries like Canada, like Germany, like Japan, uh, happening to a bit to some extent in, in Russia. Eastern European countries may change as they face this depopulation, uh, the fiscal pressures resulting from depopulation. And of course, American policy, let's remember, has turned around 180 degrees again. And despite the worrying trend that I showed in terms of American fertility, let's remember that America under Biden is already back to a very significant set of reforms around immigration uh, in a, at a technical level and at a humanitarian level that indicates that it will go back to bringing in uh, anywhere from 600,000 to a million new migrants every year. This year could become that year, again, where you go from this sort of what seemed like a death spiral of immigration and populism towards a, you know, a return to the, to the norm. So there's so many scenarios, depending on which region, which political system, and which geographic constellation you're talking about. But, uh, thank you very much, Parag. But um, well, I, I want to clarify that I meant uh, not the 8 billion people moving, but just 80 million a year. But since you brought it, you have 50% uh, at least of the population that you think are going to be losing because they are not mobile. Suppose, supposing that everyone that moves wins, which is a big supposition. But what I want to insist is on the question of uh, transitions and the importance of transitions. Uh, because if you are, what you're describing is very, very different from the current world. Um, how can we manage what, uh, whichever amount of time it takes, this transition between this current and this, the future allocations of population, uh, is this going to be progressive or would it be something that has rapid and brutal shifts with significant changes in policies, but also perhaps with other factors that uh, war, and I don't, wouldn't, wouldn't like to mention the war, the, the talk, the, the word, and what are the main factors that are capable of influencing the capacity of the people and the people that would lose out to accept the scenarios of a rather mm -hmm. changing sort of identity and countries and would not let that lead to conflict in any way. Right. Let, let me hi first highlight one word. You use the word allocation. I think that's very interesting because it does of course suggest that there is something of a process, that there is something of a you know policy, transnational, multilateral, whatever the case may be. But of course, as you and I know, there, there is no such allocation because if there is one aspect, one vestige of sovereignty that remains so sacrosanct for just about every country in the world, it is controlling its borders uh, uh, in terms of the movement of people. So there is no allocation. Everything is done unilaterally, if you will. Only in the Schengen area is there some attempt uh, to, to allow for a free movement of people circumscribed by a set of member nationalities. But we have no global allocation of people. Right. We have a de facto distribution of people based upon nationality. Above and beyond that, we have um, roughly 300 million people who are living outside of their country of nationality. Um, and that number is actually growing. And shockingly, it's, it's been increasing despite uh, the pandemic. And I would have thought the opposite would have happened. But we have some 
new data from from the United Nations and other sources that indicates that it continues to 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 rise. Um, so in terms of um, you know again this being a bottom up process, it's really about whether or not some countries such as Canada prove to be the role models that other countries follow. I gave the example of the nomad visas. Again, there was no centralized process that you know by which countries realize that they need to issue nomad visas to attract young people to have consumption in their economy during the pandemic and lockdown. It happened in a copycat fashion and it simply mushroomed in this organic way very rapidly. And I consider that a hugely positive uh, example as negligible it may be in terms of the overall number of people who've taken advantage of su such schemes, you are talking about millions and millions and we are only in the very, very, very early post-pandemic sort of phase. Similarly, if you are a country that is facing this very significant dependency ratio and depopulation and brain drain and the fiscal stress, and you are realizing that all of my smart young people are going to Canada or to Germany or to England or wherever, uh, there will be policy changes and countries will realize that they need to take the steps, whether it is like Canada or other countries. And you could actually have a very important positive uh, policy spillover effect, if you will, a learning process. And of course, I, I look to the OECD <laughs> to be the uh, to be the the northern light, if you will, in that, and to to point out that if you want to salvage your economy, you need more people. You cannot automate your way out of the fiscal challenges of depopulation, and therefore you should follow the 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 uh, the the uh, sort of example, uh, the the role model of places like Canada. So I do see a positive potential there. Then when you talk about you know some of the um, externalities or kind of you know sort of sort of factors like or or scenarios like conflict and like you know of course climate change. Well, we already have climate change induced migrations that are violent and destabilizing in nature. And climate plays a role in everything from the from Yemen to Darfur to Syria, of course. Um, and uh, and so we cannot, it's very difficult to even disentangle at this point, uh, you know, sort of uh, climate uh, conflict and migration. We, we do in fact need to, you know, have a specific body of research and which, which there is in a very nascent fashion and way at this intersection of climate uh, conflict and migration. But I don't want to riify those particular geographies where that is happening right now and subsume the entire conversation about the global, re the sort of gradual relocation of the world population and bring it, boil it down to that. Because yes, there are places where there already is migration related violence, right? And political backlash and so forth. But that does not mean that all migration will therefore proceed in a violent fashion, because as I said very clearly, you know, historically, that is not the case. Violence has been a cause of mass migration, as has economic deprivation. So 19th century Europe, 20th century Europe, and mass migrations to the United States are just one example or multiple examples of that. But that doesn't mean that they were not peacefully absorbed, because they very much were. So I think we, we, yes, there are those specific cases. Yes, we should talk about those cases. There is a very, very important legal domain that needs to be um, uh, investigated and needs to be proactively engaged with and reformed, which is of course around climate related migration because the protocols and norms around refoulement of uh, political um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers based upon uh, some assumptions or judgments that are made, uh, I don't want to say arbitrarily, but politically upon the, the, the suitability or the, the livability of places. In other words, European governments are sending asylum seekers back to Syria right now on the logic that that country is politically stable-ish enough and they can return. And of course, they are begging not to be resent, to be sent back. But if you take a climate scenario, well, we don't have a, uh, a, an exact political process at the moment, an objective process or even a legal process by which we can say such and such climate refugees can be sent back to the country that they came from. If that country has no water, you cannot in good conscience and hopefully not legally make the case that those people are to be sent back to that country. So we have to have a dialogue legally and politically on a different plane from what we have been having so far in situations like that.
I'm, I'm very conscious of time and we should bring uh, other panelists uh, uh, here, but uh, I'm, I'm, I would like to just ask one question that relates inequality to policy just very quickly. And if you can have a brief, brief answer so we can bring in the audience. I couldn't help by note, but noticing the title that you use, which is uh, subtitled Winning the War for Young Talent. And you use the, war, uh, the word war, which uh, implies that one place's win is another place's loss. And the winners seem inevitably not everywhere to be the large cities. So the question is first, what is the future for, let's say, medium-sized cities, uh, more remote regions, rural areas? And how can these areas that in principle should be losers replicate so the city living conditions to, so that they can not just retain, but also attract some talent? It's a great question. And I think there's, there's sometimes a misunderstanding around the notion of sort of the city. We've heard people say during the pandemic that the city is the loser actually, rather than the winner, which is how you're correctly, I think, positing it. People say the city has lost because they see that there has been an outflow of people from New York City and from San Francisco over the last 10 years, owing largely to the high cost of living and the high tax taxes levied on um, wage earners in those states, the state of New York uh, uh, and the state of California. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that the city has lost. And that's a complete misunderstanding of the notion of the city. Cities are always in competition with each other for talent. But the fact that New York and San Francisco may have quote unquote lost does not mean that the city has lost because Austin is a winner and Raleigh, North Carolina is a winner. And uh, you know, uh, Boise, Idaho is a winner. Seattle is a winner. In Europe over the last decade, we have actually seen that uh, quite a number of second tier cities by size have been in general winners. This is pre-COVID simply because they have a lower cost of living and a nice uh, you know, sort of um, uh, quality of life. And what we're seeing now during the pandemic is that it is actually even small towns in the United States um, and in England and in Europe that are winners. They may grow into you know, slightly larger cities than they were before, as we have this, you know, re re uh, distribution of people voluntarily based upon uh, remote work, uh, competition, uh, cost of living, and other effects. But the city, as a conurbation, you know, as an aggregation of people, actually always wins. It's really a question of which cities. Thank you very much. Uh... Um, we're going to start now with the questions from uh, the panelists. And uh, the question, I, I have a question from Juan Lopez Trigo here, which uh, highlights that, where do you think that migrants should be educated? Should they be educated if they're coming from, let's say, the global south in their own countries, in their home regions? Or should they be moved already at a very early age to the, uh, let's say, more developed countries or the places of destination? Well, again, the, the notion sort of should be moved, you know, sort of uh, connotes a certain allocation, you know, which is, uh, again, a top down uh, technocratic, you know, external process. But but that's not how migration works, of course, it would come down to countries uh, d developing these bilateral skills, partnerships and other kinds of agreements uh, with countries. And again, it's something that I strongly commend. I think it's something that some countries should do. Just look at the labor shortages, you know, that have been faced in um, uh, all across Europe and and uh, again in OECD countries during the pandemic. So, would it be wise for countries to develop those skills partnerships and recruit from certain countries to to bridge their shortages and obviously, um, you know, have worker protections, higher wages, enable that remittance uh, flow? Uh, in the reverse direction to help to uh, to contribute to uh, to economic life and family life at home, ideally, yes, you know that's the kind of thing that uh, that that developed countries uh, would be doing more of. Thank you very much. There's uh, another uh, question from Huya Malawi regarding the issue of Africa. You mentioned that Asia matters, but Africa is uh, the fastest growing continent in terms of population. 
And uh, she, well, uh, this person is asking about uh, uh, North Africa, but one of the issues that is coming from Africa, and it's clear that there has been a lot of internal migration to the big cities, but a lot of this migration is jobless growth, that a lot of people end up in slums, in the informal sector with limited capacity to progress and very often in conditions that are similar, if not worse, uh, to the places that they left at the beginning. So what can be done in this case and what can be done, especially in the light that this is the fastest growing continent? Yes, well, I mean, I think again, when it comes to, I, I don't like to generalize about African demographics or the economy because one should think of Africa rightly more in terms of sub-regions and North Africa as a set of dynamics that is different from East Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and so forth. There's of course, among migrant vectors, young populations from Sub-Saharan Africa, from West Africa, East Africa, that are make their way through North Africa and join with certain North African populations, although also separate from them in making the push towards Europe. I also don't want to generalize about whether the conditions that they find themselves in in Europe are uh, more deprived than what they face at home and so forth. That really does vary as well. Um, not all migrants, of course, many migrants who arrive are assimilated in various ways. And again, we see it more successfully in, in say, Germany or in the Netherlands than we do in, in other countries, uh, you know, let's say like in Spain or in France. And in Italy, they're making certain efforts uh, to assimilate certain groups, but not others. So it's, it's quite a, a haphazard, scattered, you know, sort of set of, of outcomes there. I do believe, though, generally, that it should be that that as a social policy and social policy is also economic policy, that one should think about, again, the migrant opportunity. And when I see the 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 um, the, the low productivity, the low output, um, the low performance of the agricultural sector and the services sector and construction sector, many sectors uh, in southern European economies, where they are, where they have labor shortages, even in agriculture, even in manufacturing, there are labor shortages. It is a matter of social and economic policy to uh, take the migrants that you do have and to perhaps get them more engaged productively in the economy the way Germany has done. So I do strongly advocate taking that German style approach um, rather than an approach that simply pushes away migrants on cultural grounds while doing nothing to deal with one's own uh, economic underperformance in a situation of very high public debt, you know, so I, I personally, you know, call me sort of technocratic in nature, but I don't have a whole lot of patience for that, uh, that, that misallocation of, of, of capital and resources. And I think that our politics needs to, uh, you know, adapt more rapidly to the migrant opportunity there. And again, I see small examples of efforts to integrate populations, uh, migrant populations into the workforce, um, and that can have an important impact. So rather than the sort of laissez-faire, you know, kind of approach where it's just sort of this is a problem and this is squalor and, you know, we can't do anything about it. That's nonsense. That's literally just nonsense, right? There are things that one can do. There are efforts that can be made. Assimilation should be an economic integration of migrants should be a strategic investment and it will yield economic value. And I think that it is imperative for governments that are in the fiscal situation that they're in uh, to make those investments. Thank you very much. There's a question from Anna Moreno Monroy uh, from the OECD, uh, mainly asking about brain drain and ethics. Uh, she asks, what do you think of the opinion that allowing high, high knowledge migrants from lower income countries into higher income countries is unethical because it contributes to brain drain and should consequently be controlled more tightly? Sure. I mean, it's certainly not a new you know, sort of counter argument to migration, there's a newer variant of it that's environmental in nature, as I'm sure you're familiar with the notion that having larger populations of migrants in, in our countries will elevate their standard of living and therefore their greenhouse gas emissions. And it is therefore economically ruinous or environmentally damaging to be for migration. So there are multiple var variants uh, that, that, that either exist, pre-exist or, or have emerged to try to limit uh, migration. And then there's, of course, there's this, uh, this ethical concern is not, not, not invalid in the sense that, of course, it does um, you know, perpetuate the difficulties that countries have in retaining talent in key areas, whether it's education or healthcare. I would say, of course, that, again, these countries do still have a large stock of human capital. 
again, when we're talking about Africa, we're still talking about um, numerous uh, countries in Africa with high fertility and large uh, populations of young people. So they can uh, invest more, of course, in education, in vocational training, and in uh, creating the incentives uh, for people to remain in their economy. Uh, of course, you know, combating corruption, improving quality of life, investing more in infrastructure and public services, um, democratization, all of these things could make remaining home more attractive. Um, they could improve their situation to be more like where India is. India is by far the largest source of net ex expatriation in the world. However, of course, it has a very large young population as well. And even though its fertility has actually declined very significantly, it still obviously has a pretty high uh, birth rate. But India is a place where either uh, they simply cannot leave because it's too expensive or actually don't necessarily want to leave because there is opportunity, right? There is growth in the economy. There are economic reforms. There is digitization. There is a lot of effort. And again, it's a, hardly a... Um, you know, a, a, a sort of a sterling democracy uh, or, or, you know, even an admirable political system in many people's eyes, but it is a place where people who are educated don't necessarily leave as soon as they have an education uh, because opportunities have been created and are being created. And there is a, a private sector, of course, that's hiring a significant number of people and so on and so forth. So I would like to see uh, African states in this situation try to emulate some of the things that are happening in India as a proximate example of what they could do to retain talent because you know they're not going to become as, as as spectacularly wealthy as China you know which is able to provide very significant incentives to retain its talented population but looking at the Indian example is perhaps an attainable objective uh, or or possibility or scenario for a number of these countries Thank you very much, Barag. We are running out of time, but there are quite a lot of uh, very interesting questions. I'm going to try to select uh, some that pop up. Uh, uh, one that I find really challenging, which is the, by an anonymous participant, is uh, the whole idea, if you can delve a bit more into um, what are your thoughts that this about how this cross-border migration of young talent uh, about how it would influence um, the existing and especially very high in some parts of the world, especially in developing countries, regional development uh, inequalities, and how would it affect, for example, the Gini coefficient? Right. So, I mean, I think, you know, it obviously depends on the situation in terms of how unequal countries are domestically. Or I think you and I both know that um, up until the pandemic, international income inequality had been declining while domestic income inequality was rising for a wide range uh, of reasons that relate to you know, global finance, trade flows, capital markets, uh, tax policy, and so on and, and so forth. So uh, again, migration is not the determining factor by any stretch of the imagination in that equation in terms of what happens to the future of domestic income inequality. Uh, and we have, of course, decades of data from the United States in which you would not attribute, and other countries too, you would not attribute large scale migration or you would not attribute heightened inequality to migration. So we should seek as much as possible to keep those around somewhat separate uh, pathways. This is much more an issue around public policy, of course, tax policy, wage policy, and these, and just in general, redistribution um, policies and the number of migrants, the stock of migrants, the migrant share of the national population is not so significant uh, that, again, it's a determining factor in, in inequality issues. It is absorbed into the public policy equation, which if that equation is broken, uh, if those policies are not doing enough, uh, it means that they're actually not doing enough to take the contributions of migrants, which as we very well know, are quite high in terms of contribution into the tax base um, and so forth, and, can, and using those to, um, if you will, shore up or to provide you know, uh, stronger safety nets for the society. So far from scapegoating migrants, knowing what we do know about their fiscal contributions to an economy, we should view them again as fiscal opportunity, not as a driver of inequality, to quite the contrary. Okay, so um, I think uh, we're running out of time, but let me just uh, focus on this one. Mikhail Eva from the University of Yash in Romania. Um, the question is, I want artificial intelligence and new technologies could lead to a decrease in need for low-skill labor force in rich countries. And is, 
is there any real significant real risk? And if so, if yes, uh, how would that impact countries with uh, lower skilled labor immigrants uh, and uh, the economies of these countries where they're from? It's a great question, but it's another one of those issues where the time horizon is, is longer than we thought and the impact is very geographically uneven, so it's difficult to generalize. Let's remember that before, you know, going back four or five years, we had studies from uh, Oxford, probably OECD as well, saying that um, you know, 40% of jobs could be automated by the year 2025 or 2030, right? Again, in a big picture way, sure, it's plausible, but the impact of that, the distribution of that is highly uneven. And as the pandemic, as we've again witnessed much more matter of factly, much more tangibly during this pandemic, we have labor shortages, right? Shortages of nurses, nurses, shortages of truck drivers, right? Hundreds of thousands of truck drivers are in need in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. So again, retail work and mobility services are meant to be the two sectors that will be most rapidly automated and here we are with massive, massive shortages in precisely those areas, because for a wide range of reasons, those technologies don't simply materialize, instantiate, and deploy themselves across the economy overnight, nor will they, quite frankly. So the fact is that humans still do a lot of things for other humans, and that fortunately, irrespective of the penetration of technology into our economy, it's as much a matter of wages as about technology. And if we were to pay people the appropriate wages for the work that they could be doing in the services economy, more people would gravitate and could be trained, of course, as well into those sectors uh, before, during, and even after automation advances across the economy. And I'm, of course, talking about teachers and about medical workers and about uh, many other sectors of the economy. In fact, you know, we the construction sector is uh, barely uh, automated at this point. Again, uh, medical profession, the educational profession. So I would still like to think, even as a technological optimist, if you will, I'm not actually an accelerationist, right? These things will not happen at such a pace that we should not be ashamed of ourselves, quite frankly, for not investing more in the human capital to render these, to have humans be trained and paid and adequately compensated to render these services to improve our overall quality of life. And rather we spend a lot of time talking about how technology will eventually get rid of these jobs. Because the fact is that we, we do need more people to do those jobs right now, long before technology is, is appearing on the scene to displace people. And this is a policy choice and it is a policy failure uh, on our part. So in terms of lower skilled economies, Yes, there is a big dilemma there. There's no question about that. The fact is that even though Asia and Southeast Asia is ground zero as the new factory floor beyond China, the net number of new jobs created in manufacturing is certainly far less than the previous generation of tiger economies of the, of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And the fact is that given the pace of automation in the manufacturing sector, it is highly unlikely that there will be a... Um, human-powered manufacturing renaissance in Africa driven by the reallocation of global supply chains because that work will have been automated before Africa becomes the low-wage center for that activity. So all of that is a roundabout way of saying that basically Southeast Asia and India are the last two regions that will benefit from a large scale capital investment in human powered manufacturing activity, and it will not come to the African continent. So Africa will have to uh, you know, d d come up with many other strategies that relate to agriculture, infrastructure, services, uh, and certainly production for sure, but internal trade um, you know, to drive employment because global manufacturing supply chains will not be coming to Africa. But let's bear in mind that it is already a diminishing share of net job creation, whereas we are becoming services economies and services are harder to displace by automation and services are those things that we should value the most. And again, that we should compensate most. So, I, so as much as the question was technological, I really wanna emphasize that it is a policy question that um, you know, more uh, humane, more sensible, uh, more human centric, if you will, uh, policy initiatives would help us to alleviate today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of other questions, but uh, we're running out of time. There was one particular question about 
populism that I'm not going to ask, but maybe the populism is short lived, but we can know. Well, I mean, there are discussions about that. If you're Argentinian, you have had on and off populism for 90 years uh, now, but uh, we also know that populism, even if it's short lived, uh, can be highly devastating. But um, without further ado, I'm going to pass on the button and I'm going to pass on the button to Claire Chavit who is going to make the concluding remar remarks. And Claire is the head of the Regional Attractiveness and Migrant Integration Unit at the Regional Development and Multi-Level Governance Division of the OECD CFE. So Claire, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, Barack. So thank you very much for this uh, high level debate, which brings us uh, into the future and uh, reveals what will be the key assets for development. It, it will definitely inspire uh, our work. So to quote uh, Dr. Kana, uh, change is happening and uh, the, this future situation has materialized today in many ways uh, under the influence of four mega trends which are well underway, climate change, demographic change, digitalization and globalization. The COVID crisis and the first steps of the recovery have underlined the interdependence and globalization of the world and impacted in a very asymmetric way together with these mega trends among places. I invite you to, to take a look uh, uh, to our, uh, at our regional recovery platform. So considering the ongoing transitions and the need for regions to be prepared for the future, how to make regions attractive for the coming years? So the OECD, and in particular, it's a regional development policy committee, uh, is working on the need to rethink regional attractiveness in the new global environment with the support of the European Union. So we are currently uh, analyzing policies and strategy to an active dialogue with 25 regions in 10 countries from Europe, uh, Latin America, and elsewhere. What they have told us uh, to date is that you cannot attract investors and visitors without attracting talent. And for the great majority of regions we work with, young talent is indeed the priority target. They have also made it clear that identifying levers for attractiveness and pursuing inclusive and sustainable development go hand in hand. And they must remain cornerstones of any strategies to make region attractive and resilient in the long term. We propose a critical rethink of indicators mirroring the multiple dimensions of attractiveness and their interaction to attract visitors, investment and talent. Understanding the characteristic of region is key. And to this end, we have proposed an innovative approach that develops regional attractiveness profiles based on over 50 uh, indicators. In addition, we all know that strategic coordination among stakeholders at different levels of government to both develop an attractive offer and then retain or better integrate migrant talent is critical. I invite you to continue exploring these areas of our work by visiting our website and reading our more recent publications links to which uh, have been provided in the chat function. So before closing, I must thank our head of division, Dorothée, Alain Dupré, uh, and my colleagues, Michael Flood, uh, Aline Mata, Maya Camacho, Peter Haxton, and Leslie Greenhold, just to name a few, and our communication colleagues, of course, for their contribution to this work and specifically for making today's dialogue happen. We will have new dialogues on the future of region in the coming months, to which you will all be invited. And today I want to thank you for your diverse and active participation. Now, let me offer our collective thanks to Parag and Andres for their time and their thoughtful contribution. A bientôt. Thank you so much. Thanks, Parag.